My previous video on the heritage of Europeans has been quite popular. However, at the time of making that video I was ill-informed and the video was to say the least factually inaccurate. I hope that this video will clear up those inaccuracies. Let's start with the early Mesolithic. In the early Mesolithic, Europe was inhabited by Eastern hunter-gatherers, Western hunter-gatherers and Caucasian hunter-gatherers. Ironically enough, Eastern hunter-gatherers fished more than they hunted. At the time, the glaciers were melting and European hunter-gatherers started spreading up north. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, there was a drought that caused the Natufians to transition from hunting and gathering into farming. Farming has not yet started to spread into Europe. The Caucasian hunter-gatherers were a mixed population of roughly half Basal Eurasian, half ancient North Eurasian origin. Basal Eurasians were closely related to the Natufians. The Eastern hunter-gatherers were roughly 70% ancient North Eurasian origin and 30% Western hunter-gatherer origin. From ancient North Eurasians, EHGs picked up some rare alleles for blonde hair and haplogroups R. Eastern hunter-gatherers also carried some Caucasus ancestry, although in a small amount. Western hunter-gatherers carried the derived alleles for blue eyes. In the Neolithic, farming quickly spreads from the Middle East all the way into Central Europe. Linear pottery culture of Central Europe derived about 70% of its genome from the Middle Eastern Natufians and only 30% from Western hunter-gatherers. There are still small pockets of Western hunter-gatherers scattered around Europe. Meanwhile, the Eastern hunter-gatherers are starting to go down south and mixing with the Caucasus HG women. Steppe cultures are beginning to appear. The steppe cultures were most likely Proto-Indo-European speaking. In the Eneolithic, Western steppe herders appear. Western steppe herders are the result of EHG men mating with CHG women. We can also refer to them as Yamne culture because they bury their dead, dead in pits, Yamui in Russian language. In the west of Europe, megalithic cultures dominated, named so for their stone monuments. They derived most of their DNA from Neolithic farmers. In Central Europe, funnel beakers and globular amphora lived. They also derived most of their DNA from European farmers. Those two groups were not Indo-European speaking, but after mixing with Yamnans gave rise to corded ware cultures. Globular amphora culture and funnel beakers were the first light pigmented Europeans aside from Matala Scandinavian hunter-gatherers. Western steppe herders mixing with the globular amphora and the funnel beaker culture created the corded ware and bell beaker cultures. Both took the Indo-European languages from the Yamnans. Interestingly, the bell beakers carried haplogroup R1b, similar to most early Yamne, whereas the corded ware carried mostly R1a. The bell beakers are responsible for the initial Indo-Europeanization of Western Europe. One thing I need to mention is that in the Copper Age, the combed ware cultures of far northern Europe were not Uralic or finno ugrian speaking. These people carried mostly R1a haplogroup and spoke Paleo-European languages. Uralians don't come into Europe until the Bronze Age. In the Bronze Age, the first wave of Siberians start to emerge in Lapland, bringing in with themselves reindeer herding. Indo-Europeans entered Greece and established Mycenaean civilization there. Most of Western Europe was already Indo-European speaking, primarily Celtic. Whether or not the netted ware culture of Eastern Europe was Indo-European or Uralic at this stage is debatable, but I tend to consider it Indo-European. Uralic languages at this point were still not spoken in Europe, in the opinion of the author of this video. In the Iron Age, we can safely say that the Uralian languages have already made their way into Europe. Most of Western Europe was already Indo-European with the exception of Basques and the Iberians.